So hi everybody, my name is Luis Bettencourt. I'm the director of the Mansueto Institute. Um, I wish I were there with you um, today, um, eating all the delicious things that we eat and so on, and with our speaker, but um, I'm in Italy for a conference on sustainable development and inequality. So some, some relation to uh, the themes um, of the talk today. So it's my great pleasure today to um, introduce Patti romero Lancao, who many of you will know because she was a fellow with us um, in the first two or three years of the Institute. And so uh, uh, she, uh, at the time already, had a joint position with the National uh, Renewable Energy Lab, one of the national labs in the DOE system, and a very special place, a place where uh, a lot of the green technologies that are changing the world are tested, are certified, are invented in many cases. And so it's a very inspiring place. Maybe if you're interested, you should talk to Patty. And uh, there are often opportunities, particularly for students and postdocs as well. So I'm just plugging that in a little bit if Patty doesn't mind. So I had gotten back in touch with Patty because uh, I always like to do so, but also because she's uh, a co-author in the IPCC reports, which as you know, set uh, the updates on the science of climate and climate change, and which uh, recently have starting to have a focus on cities and urban environments as agents of change, but also agents or places where a lot of the impacts of climate change are felt. And, and so I was hoping that she would tell us a little bit more about the IPCC process sort of as a frame and also would update us on the work that she's doing is I think may, her main project in Los Angeles uh, in part applying a lot of these principles but also with a strong element of that local context um, where uh, many of these transformations are put in practice and they also the project has a little bit of a parallel to our own crocus project here at uh, in Chicago. So with all that said, and no, uh, not much further ado, uh, Patty, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. And we really look forward to hearing uh, your updates and all this exciting work uh, that you're doing and how people here could be involved. So thank you, take it away. So thank you. Um... Luis, and thank you everyone for inviting me to, to participate or to present, to share with you some thoughts on my work on cities and climate change. And I really struggled a lot. I was thinking, oh, I should tell them about the IPCC and the amazing work they do and how we went from just having a chapter on industry and settlements and society in the, uh, you know, the people of the IPCC to then having for, and this was for working group too, uh, to then having uh, chapters, urban chapters for working group two, working groups two and three. Working group two works on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. And the third works on mitigation uh, policies and uh, et cetera. So I, I, I was like, okay, I, I should present about that. But what I decided to do is to share with you uh, the work we have been doing for and uh, with uh, the utility, the Department of Water and Energy in Los Angeles. Two years ago, we were asked to um, engage, to develop an approach to dealing with the equity challenges of transitioning the city of Los Angeles to 100% renewable energy sources in equitable ways, okay? So I decided to go for the second because I have learned so much and I want to share it with you. As Louis already said, and you guys being experts in urban issues, uh, uh, will be like hearing how I speak, preach to the choir. It's occupy a central role, not only as key sources of emissions and hotspots of vulnerability, but also as the places where many of the innovations, many of the programs that are seeking to move us away from our climate challenges uh, are taking place. Uh, I was part of efforts uh, seeking to make sure that the IPCC endorsed the need for a transformative research agenda on cities and climate change. And together with other colleagues, we 
wrote some papers in uh, uh, Nature Sustainability where we were claiming that it was important to include cities as key players in this arena. Uh, I can share with you the paper we wrote because it was very critical of what IPCC is doing, but I, I will do it. What I want to do is to share one of the key points we make in that paper. And it was that although there is a lot of interest on issues of cities and climate change, the current research practice is still has still a long way to go to address the root causes and the links between unequal urban development and climate change. Mm -hmm. And therefore I decided that it was important to share with you how our, my experience trying to do that with the city of Los Angeles. And with that in mind, uh, what I want to do is to share some lessons learned uh, with you on from the what is called the LA 100 equity strategies uh, that can inform not only action but also research on how to foster equity in, in this case in sustainable energy transitions. So with this in mind, what I will do today is to focus on three key points. Briefly describe to you what LA 100 equity strategies is. Second, why I think that with all the challenges we face, LA100 equity strategies has developed a methodological approach that is groundbreaking. And I'm happy to be challenged by you and to challenge you back because that's what I came here to do. And, uh, and third, by so doing, I will be drawing some lessons that can inform not only what other city officials and utilities and et cetera are doing in this field. So let me get started. Um, five years ago, the Department of Water and Energy asked uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab to model uh, the pathways to transition the city away from carbon and the, the an era where I, I work, I still work, <laughs> I, um, ended up with a project uh, that said that it was possible to transition away from carbon in, and offers different scenarios and timelines to do so. Based on that, two years ago, the city decided that they would commit to transition, I mean, to, to create a, an, a clean energy system by 2020. 35. But one key finding of this report, which was also forced by mobilization of CBOs, not only by the nice and amazing uh, response of city officials, one of the key findings was that uh, indeed it is possible to, to transition uh, away from carbon and that this transition will provide significant greenhouse gas air quality and public health benefits. But while all communities will benefit from this model clean energy scenarios, what they also found that was that improving equity in participation and outcomes requires more than modeling efforts, requires more than optimization, requires more than, equity, uh, than quantitative data. It requires intentionally designed equity strategies. And this is where I was invited to lead the social science components of this huge project I will describe to you. Our goal with this project was to create information knowledge that allowed to ensure that the city achieved the transition while at the same time improving energy equity. And that sounds easy, but believe me, it's messy. And it's contested, and it's all, all but uh, easy. So that's where we are now, right? And let me now move to, to, to explaining to you why I think that when we have been doing this, all its limitations, I could devote a seminar just to talk about the limitations mm -hmm. we face and the challenges, and, but that would be great. Because I want that Luis invites me. 
So let me now tell you why this methodology is uh, groundbreaking. What we did was to build on scholarship that is growing, particularly in Europe, but also in the US. On a, and, and it is connecting approaches to energy transitions with approaches to energy equity. There are also scholars working on uh, climate equity and environmental equity, but I want to focus on energy equity. So these approaches are suggesting that if we want to achieve an equitable transition, uh, we need at least to address and to operationalize three tenets of energy justice. The first, procedural justice, which you see here, is seeking to make sure that community members, particularly those disadvantaged and excluded from the benefits of the current energy systems, have a leadership, have a, a voice in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. Second, related to that, it's important to understand, understand what is more challenging, address past and current inequities. It's equally important is to address the legacies of redlining, the legacies of uh, infrastructure sitting that tends to be located in disadvantaged Latino, African American communities. So those two, addressing those two is key to making sure that in this transition, we are able to create a more equitable and just distribution of benefits and negative impacts. So what we did with this project is not only to say these beautiful things, but to make sure we operationalize them. We move them from our beautiful desks, our boards, our nice and amazing papers, to actionable knowledge that city officials can use if they decide that they want to use it, because that's another thing that I don't want to refer to now. <laughs> so what is what we did? We developed a, a framework with a timeline as to how is it that we could, in terms of the governance of our project, would do. And as you can see, we decided to create a steering committee that you see here, an advisory committee. And the steering committee uh, was made up of CBOs that we selected based on criteria such as their work with disadvantaged communities, uh, their ability to create a ballots that could support city officials, you know, uh, create, uh, in the case of LA, uh, it's important to get approval of more than 65% of the population to change the rate structure of the city. So things like that. Oh, I don't know what I did, but let me continue here. Then um, in this steering committee, we ended up having 15 CBOs uh, working on these issues. The criteria was again, not only to have this kind of nice uh, uh, skills, but also to work with disadvantaged Angelinos. We are talking about 59% of the population in Los Angeles is disadvantaged. And then we created an advisory committee that would be able, and it, uh, this advisory committee is made up of city officials in transportation, housing, the grid, who are able to tell us, oh, you're shooting to the moon and suggesting all these actions is great, but it's not feasible. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to confront, etc. And then, as you see here, all these little circles show that we held monthly uh, meetings with these uh, CBOs, members of the steering committee, and then with the advisory committee, we held by monthly meetings. Besides that, and that's where you see these little circles, and that was something we did with Nicole Rosner, who was also a is also a fellow at the at the Mansueto Institute, and became my pal, my friend, my buddy, the one I cried with whenever I was very frustrated <laughs> when we were not achieving. So, what we social scientists did was to create or to use a series of elicitation tools such as focus groups 
which community members decided to call um, listening sessions. They hate the focus group work. They find it too extractive and too powerful. So we held a series of uh, focus groups, conversations with them, one-on-one -on -one meetings. But besides that, and this is the other circle, we were the ones who were informing the modelers efforts to decide what to prioritize in their models and what to simulate. They also came back and told us what we needed to tell communities. And again, the feedback loops were not easy. I, I don't want you to believe that we had it all clear. We had the gut instinct. We had the prior experience doing this. But we did a lot of patching and navigating challenges. So again, our first phase was uh, intended to identify and understand the priorities, the aspirations of disadvantaged communities, the barriers that they face, and the solutions they suggest to inform the modelers, right? And then to inform a series of processes seeking to develop strategies, equity strategies, equity scenarios, et cetera. So that's the timeline. And uh, uh, let me just quickly say that uh, in the division of labor, we created the modelers focus more on distribution and justice, trying to understand issues of affordability how the rate structure, existing rate structure, which is uh, excluding and uh, negatively affecting disadvantaged communities could be changed to, uh, to get money, to you know, invest in infrastructure, et cetera, in ways that benefit disadvantaged communities the most. There were also uh, a couple of model, uh, groups, modeling groups working on housing, uh, on solar and storage, transportation, electrification, grid reliability and resiliency, and air quality. Today, I won't talk about that because that's not my area of expertise. And also because I believe that what we added to this effort is what you guys, I would like you to hear and to, to, to learn about. But I, I just want to start with something which will bring me to share my first lesson learned with you. In, uh, as part of the distributional uh, justice analysis, uh, our quantitative people uh, helped me uh, do an, run an analysis of a series of LADWP, that's the utility programs, sticking to support the installation of solar, improvements on energy efficiency, uh, access incentives to, to get access to electric vehicles, and uh, this uh, customer discounts, which mostly benefit disadvantaged communities. And what we found, and it's not a surprise, is that mostly not disadvantaged communities receive 56% of the benefits, although they are a minority in LA, and they tend to be concentrated in West LA, the beautiful Hollywood, you know, the, the, the nice area where everything smells good, there's a lot of green, et cetera. Uh, solar net energy metering and EV incentives disproportionately benefited wealthy populations. You will notice the language we are using because there are a lot of institutional and political constraints. And we cannot speak so openly about race in the US, for instance. So that's why you, you see all these sophisticated evasion and reformulation of knowledge, right? And uh, low-income uh, communities uh, mostly benefit from these two programs. So the distribution of LADWB programs is unequal. And that happens with everything. So why is that? And that's where I want to make the first claim because uh, we, we realized with Nicole Rosner that targeting only distributional justice could not be enough. With all the beautiful numbers we created, could not be enough to inform equity strategies that are more 
uh, energy strategies that are more equitable. So we need to also operationalize recognition and procedural justice. And this is where I want to share with you what we did in a kind of very quickly <laughs> way. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the work I did with Nicole Rosner, again, uh, Liz Blanco, another anthropologist, and a geographer, Daniel Simney Schmidt, all of whom uh, Luis knows because we collaborated with them in prior projects where we, the two organizations work. Okay, so, but where are our goals? Uh, our goals were to use mixed methods approaches uh, uh, to examine community-guided energy equity strategies that help us operationalize recognition and procedural justice. In so doing, we are in the process just now as we speak to develop a roadmap for uh, energy equity strategy development. Let me tell you that as I always learn to do with the IPCC, we are not recommending LADWP what to do. That's not our role. We are just providing knowledge that is policy relevant. So it's really important to say that because um, that line is, is key for us to keep our integrity. Here you see where we held 10 of the 15 uh, listening sessions we held, five were held virtually. So we held a, a total of uh, 15. What was our analytic approach? Uh, we decided to organize our thinking around the problem space where with communities, we were able not only to identify their aspirations, but also the barriers they face, the problems they are dealing with. Uh, and move from that space, which I always feel comfortable as a scientist, to the solution space, because that's what the world needs now. They don't need that we think about this for three years. They need action. Many communities told us, we are tired of you guys coming and telling us, oh, we are doing this, blah, blah, blah. Where is something real and tangible for us, right? So the political, but, but what is important is that in this space, the solution space needs to be grounded on a good understanding of what the problems are and what root causes are underlying those problems. Because if not, we will just be wishy-washing and offering incre incremental policies that are just like um, making up things, you know? So then you see here goals that define also equity outcomes because many community members told us, well, there needs to be one way to monitor progress, to make sure that we benefit, to make sure that we hold the city accountable. And, and so these equity outcomes are not only about looking into the future and organizing our thought to get there, it's about making sure we measure performance. We also were very aware of the need to elicit values underlying uh, the, the framings of problems and solutions. So, and for this, which we are still developing, we are doing an analysis and, uh, of how all these beautiful <laughs> strategies I will share with you, uh, how feasible they are, what role the political context plays in constraining them or facilitating them. And that political context has to do with Issues such as Proposition 26, it was promoted by a, lot, a, a huge coalition in, in California to make sure that any increase in, in, in rates uh, it goes through a ballot and does not end up subsidizing the poor when according to our analysis, the poor are subsidizing the wealthy, but that's another story, okay? Mm -hmm. so. We need to understand that, and that's where we are at just now. Okay, let me then move to the next methods. I already referred to some examples of our statistic analysis. And we also did a, a, a deep and, and systematic literature review, which allowed, allowed us to understand how the city came to be so unequal. What role redlining, what role, many things you are aware of because Chicago also experiences 
play in explaining the factors that we are now seeing as barriers to achieve equity in this transition. And we rely on listening sessions, focus groups, right? That I will refer to. And today I will mostly refer to that effort because being a mixed methods person, I'm convinced that numbers allow you to understand associations, trends, magnitudes. But when you are talking about humans, qualitative methods allow you to understand why things happen, how they happen. What are the deep power dynamics that are like the elephant in the room that you only can understand when you are there? Listening, listening and listening, okay? So here is what we did with our qualitative uh, data collection methods. As I was telling you, we had, we held 15 listening sessions. We paid communities for the time. Uh, that was a hard thing. It took us four months of writing and writing and writing on best practices to be able to get that from LADWP. Not because they are terrible, it's just they are also constrained by their organizational structure. Okay, so uh, we, uh, because we wanted this to be a co-produced effort, we partnered with CBOs and, and together with them, we designed uh, elements of the uh, listening sessions for them to be adapted to the areas where we work, right? So we did that, we transcribed uh, the, the, the uh, one thing more is we had 36, virtual participants, 103 in-person participants, um, and we work with representative disadvantaged areas in LA. That is really important. It took us three months to come up with those decisions. We develop a table with metrics together, okay? So again, we, we held, uh, the, the sessions mostly uh, lasted two hours. Uh, we, we recorded everything with the authorization of participants, transcribe it. Many of the participants speak only Spanish, which was good for you. I feel like in heaven. I was like, wow, telling how I feel in Spanish. Woo, beautiful. So, so we also translated those, etc. Because we didn't have enough money to do all this. We, you know, how is the academic board? You need 500, you get 200, right? You need 1,000, you get 200. <laughs> no, it's just okay. So, <laughs> okay, let me share with you the preliminary findings, and let me start with this. Which you will say, what is that? Well, this is the dialogue composition. Uh, we use Max, um, Max Q, D, uh, ah, we use a, 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 um, to, um, an app to, to transcribe and to code everything, right? And what you see here is uh, how we started to um, go first deductively with our uh, conceptual approach, then inductively with what the data were showing. And there were many things we need to revise. Don't think that. Bringing the two together is like getting a sandwich, right? The upper part is clear, the middle part is clear. You just need ham. No, <laughs> you, you need more than that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, here are the, the areas I already characterized for you. But you will see it here also the composition of the dialogues and how in some of the listening sessions, participants focus more on values on the need to shift the paradigm, the way decisions are made. Others focus more on causal factors, impact areas. Others just came with strategies. I mean, it was amazing, I mean, to listen to what this community said and to triangulate it with what the uh, scholars say is feasible was really, really humbling to me. Patty, okay. could you so, explain? Uh, Sorry, I'm jumping in and maybe awkward. Patty, could you explain? I don't understand those those diagrams you were showing, and the various colors and what's the <laughs> horizontal dimension. Yeah. Just the dots here yeah. are the numbers of, number of times that communities refer, in this case, to actions, right? The blue one, or to causal factors, or to values which are the purple. 
And can why you, was that? Can you give us examples? Me, can you give us examples of what each one of these means? Let me finish. I, I will finish. You will see it. The only thing I wanted to say now is that this for us is a measure of saturation. It's the, a measure of how recurrent in some topics, some concerns, some suggested actions, some understandings of fossil factors were in the dialogues we had with communities. So that's what, uh, what, uh, what you see here. And it was also our way to talk to people such as you, Luis, who really say, okay, I mean, how are you selecting a quote? What does that quote represent? And the quotes I will read to you represent the recurrence of a sentiment of a grievance of a, you know, understanding of what the problem is and what the solutions are. So that's what that is. Sorry, Luis, I just wanted to finish my line of thought. Yeah, okay. So let's move to the next one. Aha, uh -huh, please. Do you, do you expect differences across the county or across the city in terms of the dialogues that the community has had? Uh, if there had been differences, we would need to go back to the board because a key element of qualitative work is that you are trying to elicit a, an understanding that cuts across groups. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's why, again, we show those uh, that dialogue compositions just to see whether we were wrong and we needed to revisit things. And I will refer to one example. We identified four, four cross-cutting priority areas at the beginning when we, when we were designing our work. Those were health and community resilience, safety and community resilience, jobs and workforce development, access and use, and affordability and burden. By, five, by this time, we needed to add one other priority area, which is inclusive decision making. So it is this going from the deductive approach, right, where you are just setting a stage to, add, to what the data tell you. Inductively, it is that what allows you to calibrate such a space. But think about this. <laughs> okay, let me go back. Um, let me start with this. Is again an example of all the values or the key values shared with us, uh, uh, the, the community members share with us. And this is really telling. This person from South LA tells us. The very definition of equity, which we spent a lot of time talking about, and even now those of us who have been disadvantaged are sometimes uncomfortable with, means it's not about how much. It means that we, we all made a commitment that until, until we, the disadvantaged, catch up, nobody else gets anything. So more and more of it becomes ours because we have been unequitably treated. But what we want to know is how is it proceeding? So this person is talking about two things. One is the city has excluded them. And now we are coming with this transition and now people need to buy electric vehicles and solar, et cetera, and change their panels, update their panels. But where do they get the money to do that? And who will subsidize them, support them when all the money, as you saw in the analysis, that they didn't see when we visited them? All the money is, or grand part, a big chunk of the money goes to the privilege. And this person is saying, we also want to know how we will proceed because they are tired again of us going and telling them, this time it will be different. We really want to work with you. We are in this together. They really want that this changes. That's a, 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 a value and ethical approach that many community members talk about. And, and that's what you saw in the composition there. Okay, let me now try to summarize key findings in the area of procedural justice. What is what with, um, communities told us within the problem space? They identify top-down decision-making that doesn't leave space for community involvement, for community voice agency in their own energy present and futures. They also identify a lack of transparency, 
continuity and accountability with ratepayers. And they, they told us that that uh, resulted in, I didn't tell it, but that's, that's our reading, right? In distrust, there is a lot of mistrust. There are many grievances. And they don't, they, they, they lack uh, accessible and usable information. Many said like, well, I, I, I don't speak English. And, and people tell me I need to fill this form. I, I don't know how to fill it. I'm old. That's another concern we heard. I, I, I don't use internet. How do, you know, how do they want me to fill this, right? Um, so moving to the solution space, they um, wanted that, and that's what I will refer to also with quotes, that they have a say in the co-development of programs and services that the utility and the city officials develop tailored outreach and education. And overall, like an overarching issue that the city as a whole works better on making sure that their regulations uh, are enforced, that someone can hold many predators that they identify, solar predators, credit, uh, banks, etc., that someone did something to hold them accountable. They also, I mean, this, this kind of efforts can result in equity outcomes, and these are procedural ones, such as accountability, more accountability, more responsibility. If you are starting metrics, there was a program seeking to initiate uh, equity metrics in uh, within the utility. And everyone was like, what happened with the equity metrics? Nothing. They were upset. And we were the ones who sometimes were like sweating, you know, like, let me finish. I, we are just doing this. But I, we understood that they, they were upset, right? OK, so let me read to you some, some, some of the, again, of the many quotes that are, uh, are at the heart of 11 strategies, equity strategies, equity energy strategies that we are to discuss with LADWP next week during my birthday. I don't know whether that will be a good birthday or not, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> the first one is this idea of program and service co-development. And, and, and let me I mean, read this to you. This person, this lady said, this is where the technology comes in. For centuries, we have been marked by redlining. They know which communities are most in need. And this is where using technology to our advantage comes, to know where to start, what places need to have access, obviously, to pay for the cost of a better life. And there are many, many quotes like this. So, uh, what, what we are uh, we are to tell uh, the uh, LADWP, and they have been really open to us being crazy. Believe me, there was one moment where the, where the, the uh, manager collaborating with us told me, but okay, okay, you are right, I got it. I know we need to work on this. Okay, thank you. I really appreciate that you insisted that we did it. So I, I felt better about it. <laughs> so beyond grounding LADWP's direction to focus engagement efforts and technology investments in communities that continue to live with the consequences of legacies of institutionalized injustice, it is still vital to consider how that relationship between LADWP and these communities will be rebuilt. Rebuilt. We're talking about rebuilding confidence and trust and getting buy-in, without which guys, no matter how dire the climate change situation is, we won't get there. Okay, now let me th uh, read a quote to you on, that led us to suggest, suggest through an analysis, um, this uh, second equity strategy to have tailored outreach and education. This person said, one strategy could also be what we are doing right now, to provide educational opportunities for more people, to help them reflect on how to avoid destroying our planet. 
So, and then we talk to people, helping them understand. And you know that the, the promoter model works well because the community knows us, so they trust us. Here comes the lady who, let's see, tells us, they listen to us, they have the confidence to tell us, it is true, you are right, or it is not true. You know, I had this problem with this person who just ripped me off my money, et cetera, et cetera, right? So what we are suggesting is that by incorporating energy education into a social network of trusted messengers, in this case, the promotoras, the salud, which are health promoters that already exist in their communities, this participant is suggesting that both LADWP and residents will benefit more. So there are already elements of social and human capital that the city can build on to, to create that rapport. Okay, let me now move to this overarching um, energy equity strategy, uh, seeking to improve city regulations, accountability and enforcement. This person says there is a lot of barriers, especially with old houses. And Boyle Heights has a ton of old houses. I think Chicago does too, by the way. Mm -hmm. or, or they have houses that are old that were flipped. Like a friend of mine just bought a house on Lorena and the flipper just basically hid all the old stuff in there. And when he found out that basically it was a fire hazard for him, to have these old electrical wires, blah, 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 right? So this person says the regulations just aren't there and there's no support for families who can't afford to fix these things. So there were many other people saying that there needs to be some trust resources to help Angelinos understand, assess, and navigate this transition in their own homes. Because many of us, me included, need to update our panels if we want to have electric vehicles that charge at the level two. And, and to have the heat pumps, which cost, by the way, between seven and 13,000 pesos, uh, dollars. I, I wish it was pesos. <laughs> okay, so community members said, you need to have the information and support to prevent unsafe environments and predatory practices that have historically burdened these communities, right? So, let me now move to recognition justice aspects. I don't know how much time I have. Okay, I'll go fast. So here is where communities refer to the historical legacies present in current policies, practices, built environment characteristics, um, and also how, for instance, if you want to deal with energy affordability, your ability to pay the electricity bill, you need to consider that people need to pay also for housing, for education, for health, for transportation. And they ask, and there is a, a lot of scholarship on that, that a, a, a more holistic approach to these energy insecurities is developed to help them navigate these things, right? So then they refer to four, uh, uh, um, actions that we then translated into strategies. And I will go faster because I want to finish. <laughs> the first is this idea of affordable and safe upgrades. This person says, while I appreciate raising the concern about addressing current infrastructure, ensuring up that infrastructure, uh, I also wonder if there is a plan to remediate some of the infrastructure that currently exists in South LA that is problematic in terms of known adverse health outcomes. One thing is capacity. Does our infrastructure have the capacity to deal with these things? Because this person and many others said they have a sense of neglect. They have a sense that only the west side of LA receives everything. Everything is beautiful there. One lady even said, I breathe and I feel good here. I go back to my place and I don't breathe well, right? So, so what this person is saying is we need to see how is it that we are going to fix the existing to allow place for the future to come. And that's a huge challenge in LA 
in Chicago, in Toronto, in Mexico City, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the kind of things that we need to address as well. Okay, then the, uh, the issue of bill assistance and debt relief. They mm -hmm. came with very amazing ideas to address that. This person said, for instance, and, and many others were referring to something similar because particularly with the pandemic, they fell behind. And, 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 and they were like, I don't know how to get back on my feet. Okay, so they were suggesting if the bill was split from the starting of the pandemic to where you said it's over, if that bill was split between what you owe presently and then you were out a payment plan for people, they were saying if you allow us to pay over time and didn't tell us, well, you know, you owe, some people were talking 4,000, for people who earn 35,000 a year, even 60,000 guys, you know, 60,000 don't, don't get you too far, okay? So, okay, then they also ask for targeted programs and investments and targeted means targeted to disadvantaged communities because they know what our numbers say, right? So the issue around charging stations was already put on the table. They are supposed to be put in neighborhoods that need them the most. The state offered cars to people without charging stations. And the, this guy was saying, well, we are in a circular conversation because how can you have a car when you don't have charging? That? And particularly if you guys consider that 69% of Angelinos are renters. So there is also another constraint there, okay? This person said electrification with the government saying that all vehicles will be electric at like what? 2013, or no, it is 2035 for, for here, right? Can do that if you don't have the infrastructure and you can do that if you don't fix the homes to have the infrastructure, you see? So then there are many layers that need to be addressed in this transition. And we were able to, to, to dig into the, this through our com Combining the quantitative work with our qualitative work. That's the point I want to hear, okay? And then um, another key challenge that many ask us to address is the homeowner renter issue, where my many renters don't even have access to, to the bills. They need to pay the, the homeowner. Uh, they don't have access to benefits because they are renter, renters, et cetera, right? So, uh, and they were referring to the issue of displacement and gentrification. They are concerned that all this transition can result in that. This person says the owners, if they upgrade the staff, they are going to raise the rents. Thank God we live in a rent control area. If you don't live in a rent control area, you got to think real carefully if this good, if you want that problem. So they are really concerned. They know that it has happened, not only in the US, sadly, it's a worldwide problem, right? So, okay, and then this is another one, uh, regulate predatory solar de developers. We were not aware of that. Many solar developers come to these communities, tell them, hey, don't worry, we'll put uh, solar in your roof, and what do I need to do? You don't need to pay any, don't worry. Guess what? Everyone said, Two months later came the bill, the additional bill they needed to pay. And uh, that's, that's what this person is referring to and how this is relating to or resulting in a lot of um, distrust, you know, mistrust. A lot of uh, people don't know what to do. They are uncertain. They are, they are not convinced that what the city wants to do is the way to do. And okay, here um, we use a Sanke, uh, um, Sankey uh, diagram to relate what we heard here. Here you see the number of times uh, a, an issue was uh, related to uh, a solution. Uh, and this is beautiful. These kind of uh, diagrams are beautiful because it allows you to see how by addressing these problems through 11 equity strategies, you can increase energy democracy you can increase your pipe and training. Um, you can increase parity in access, a key problem. 
decrease environmental exposure and decrease energy burden. And with this, I want to close because I, I uh, just by saying two things. In our field work, we realize that participants refer more or more to institutional, cultural, and socioeconomic barriers than as um, infrastructural barriers per se. And the infrastructural were also always related to the institutional ones. That's one uh, thing. And then, of course, the equity strategies we suggested is the second key finding. And here you see some of the pictures of the um, listening sessions we had with these people. And I, with this, I want to close because I know I, I want to hear from you. Thank you. We should. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. That was uh, really insightful. Uh, I have two questions, but you're very welcome to pick only one if you want. Uh, the first one is about the role of the local state. Um, could you say a couple more words about which parts of the local state are involved and in which parts of this process mm -hmm. and how they have different stances maybe on the whole project and uh, yeah, those kind of things. Uh, and would you say that this whole project has a rather privatized approach. I've heard you speak a lot about um, homeowners and housing uh, and these infrastructures. Is there a way of thinking about this in the project in a more sort of way of, of urban commons or infrastructures that are not reliant on individuals right. being the sort of key in this? Right. Uh, the, the second is easier. <laughs> yeah, we were considering a, a community solar. Uh, we are considering also the use of, uh, they are called um, community resilient hubs. I, I was not able to discuss them here, but we were considering many of these things. And for the first question, I, I can tell you that although we were working only with LADWP as a, our sponsor, so to speak, uh, we were also able to have lots of meetings with transportation officials, with um, housing officials, uh, et cetera. But my sense, and this is not new to you, is that many work on silos mm -hmm. and uh, they always tell you, uh, this is what I can do, I'm transportation, you're housing, you know? And we were like, oh, guys, what these communities are experiencing needs uh, aligned efforts and coordinated efforts. And another important thing is, both within LADWP and my organization, we are also siloed. So that is really hard. Uh, and that's something I couldn't talk about. It's really hard to, just to understand each other, you know? We just need to finish our things and then we don't leave so much time to learn from each other, etc. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So you were, at least from the map that you showed us, working specifically with the city of Los Angeles, but LA is more often thought of as a region um, and LA County has a lot of, I mean, there's like 40 different governments, I think in Los Angeles County. Um, so have you guys thought about the nature of equity efforts that takes a more regional approach? At the beginning of the project, we wanted to have a regional approach. We even wanted to work with some of the indigenous communities that are affected by decision or basing decisions of uh, LADWP. Uh, and we got a lot of pushback. No way. And that's an experience I also had in Mexico and in Santiago de Chile, whereby authorities just want to work with the entity. Again, this is a siloed approach. I mean, we all talk about integration. Guess what? I don't know where we can achieve it, although I know it's important. So yeah, that's, that, that was our, we wanted to do it. We got a lot of pushback. No way. It's out of scope. Does DWP only serve the city though? It, it, it serves the city, uh, but it brings resources from other areas. And that's why we were saying, come on. <laughs> No, we, we couldn't. Yeah. Speaking of pushback, and I, I think you probably said this at the very beginning, but I may not have caught it. How did you get LADWP to work with you all in the first place? What was the like contextual impetus for that? Why would they be willing? Well, they started to work with a bunch of engineers in the first uh, two years. Mm -hmm. And that's, and through that, 
the engineer said, we can do also a social science thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where they invited me to lead the social science mm -hmm. part. But honestly, in the hierarchy of life, social scientists always get to be down below, you know? And, and so it was really hard for us even to convince uh, some members of the group internally that doing community engagement with communities, not only with CBOs, mm -hmm. was key in an equity project. If it had been an optimization project. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So am I correct that it started with uh, LADWP was working with engineers primarily thinking about um, how to equitably distribute renewable energy in the future. And it was the engineers who at some point along the process started advocating for no. Um, you all on board, no. or was there also push from you guys? There was push before I joined. There was push for CBOs from mm -hmm. CBOs who said, "What are you talking about, guys? This is only optimization, and how beautiful! But look at these communities, and look at these inequities." Yeah. And, and to your point, there needs to be coalition building mm -hmm. if you want to create things. Yeah, yeah. you know. And and then when I joined. I, I really just was torn. I said, no way. I mean, either we do this or just let me know I leave. I mean, I'm not gonna wishy watch what you want to do. Yeah. And I got some support from champions, you know, coalition building yeah. uh, to, to do this. And now everyone says, oh, it was so necessary. I was like, of course it was necessary. <laughs> so yeah. These efforts are not technical exercises, mm -hmm. not even research exercises. They are political exercises. Mm -hmm. And for me, it has been really humbling to learn that the hard way, you know? Yeah. It, one thing is to read about it and be outsider observing things, and the other is to live them firsthand. Yeah. Any other comment? Okay, I think we are. Thank you, thank you, and I wish I, I, I had more to just compare to all the recognitional and procedural challenges, which is another two set of chapters. But if you, if you want, we can have conversations on this. I really appreciate your attention, but because it's lunchtime and we all get tired. Okay, thank you. Thanks for coming back to us. Thank you, guys. I'm really excited. I really love this season. So. Thank you.